Baptism has always had a significant and important meaning to the church. In fact, there are stories going back to the first and second century that give us this really distinct impression where you have new believers, new disciples, they would come around the church for a long time before actually being a part of the life of the church until they were deemed ready for baptism. So why is baptism important to the church or, or why should baptism be important for a new believer? Baptism, the experience gives us a new voice. Uh, it gives us a new identity to live in. The baptism experience itself becomes an anchor in a brand new story. The new believers, those that were going to be baptized, would gather together, oftentimes on the midnight before Easter, and they would make their way down to a small river or lake or pond, and they would wade all the way down into the water. church family, those that were going to be there with them, would hand them a new garment, a white robe. They were taking on a new identity, even as they shed their own. So here it is our life, and under those waters we will find our end and our beginning. Good stuff, huh? Boy, you are deathly quiet, right? <laughs> hey, uh, I'm excited about Easter, and I'm excited about the potential of many baptisms and we've had several people sign up and we are uh, continuing to talk about it because we believe it is a great next step um, for many many who are coming to Crossbridge. In fact um, I think it's a really important part of your spiritual spiritual journey. I love what he said when he said it is the um, it's this proclamation of new life and baptism can be the anchor right the anchor in which we look back to and say man that is the day in which my old life died and my new life started. And, um, and he was talking about even you know, years ago, right, history, on the eve of Christmas Eve, or uh, Christmas Eve, of Easter. And um, I think there is, there's such significance with actually baptism taking place on Easter weekend. Uh, the picture of it, um, it's identifying with that weekend and exactly what has happened for each of us, that when Christ went down into the grave, and then when he came out of that grave, we come out of the water, that we're saying, man, I not only like, do I believe this story here, I believe it here, and it's changed who I am. And so I would encourage you after the service, um, I want you to, if, if you have not been baptized, maybe if you're still thinking about it, um, Pastor Sherry will be right down here, and you can come see her and talk to her about that. You know, a couple other things as I'm talking about Easter. Um, we did this at Christmas, and we're going we're gonna to do the same thing. Uh, we recognize that come Easter weekend, there's a whole lot of people who show up. It's everyone shows up who calls Crossbridge their home. Plus, you go out and you get all your neighbors and friends, which is a wonderful thing. But we also know this. We know with the size of our worship center, we have to spread our people accordingly. Uh, that we can't have everyone show up at 930 or everyone show up at 11 because we would have a problem. And so one of the things we're doing, it worked. And so we're going to do it again. We're doing the RSVP. That does not mean that like, you know, you're locked in if something were to change. It also does not mean that if you don't RSVP, you can't show up, right? This is not a ticket. What it is though, is just an indicator to us as a church to be able to see where we are in the midst of those four services here and the two services, three services in Peru um, to see that we have a balance. And if we see that it's starting to get out of balance, I'll come and I'll say to you, hey, just so you know, like we have 1,200 people signed up for eight o'clock. So some of you need to shift, right? And uh, I'll keep you informed. You can do that through the website. Through the website, there's a um, Easter RSVP. Or you can go right back to the Welcome Center directly following the service, and Pastor Galen will show you exactly how to do it. Okay, fair enough? All right. You know, um, 
Last week, we talked about checking ourselves. And uh, we talked about checking ourselves in regards to how God has made us, right? Thinking about how God made us, thinking about how he loves us, and thinking about his desire to reproduce his character in us. In fact, this week, I, I flew from Indianapolis to Chicago, and I got on those yellow feet, and I did this, and I thought of each of you, right? And uh, I wish I could have videoed it. Um, and I did not have to go in the back room and get searched. So it was a great thing. You know, there are a few places in the New Testament that I think speak very clearly to the character of God. Um, the character of God that I believe he hopes to reproduce in each of us. And we're going to look at one of those passages today. In fact, um, it's kind of a, you may think it's kind of odd. Um, you know, you, you show up on a weekend at Crossbridge and the topic of the day is feet. Does that sound exciting? We're going to talk about feet. Some of you are like, oh, gross. I don't want to talk about feet, right? But, but that's what we're talking about. So John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Let's take a look at it. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He would loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he'd come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, he took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who's bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him, and that is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and he sat down, and he asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master. Nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God bless you for doing them. Father, thank you. <clears throat> I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to share your word. I'm thankful for the way that you share with me during the week. Um, and then I have an opportunity to pass that along. I'm praying that today will be less about my words and more about yours. And I pray that you would connect them to the hearts of your people. I trust that you are in this place. And I trust that you want to speak to us today. We give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, you know, just so you can prepare yourself at the end of the service, everybody's going to whip off their shoes, right? I'm just joking. <laughs> You're like, no way, right? Just like Peter. Uh, you know, I, this passage, it challenges us to check ourselves in a variety of areas. In fact, I think this passage is... On the surface, it's, it's a couple of things that instantly come to sight, and then we're going to get into something a little bit deeper as we get to the end of this. Uh, the first thing is, I think it causes us to ask the question of how are we doing loving people? How are we doing loving the people around us? You know, the first and greatest commandment, right, is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and the second is to love our neighbor as well. And so that's a really, really important thing. It's important that we're finding practical ways that we're expressing this love, that we actually have a genuine concern about the people around us. Loving people, I believe, looks like serving people. You look at John 13, 1, it says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. Now, listen to this line. He'd loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It's almost this picture that says, now, and now he loved them to the very end. It's, it's this picture that says, what I'm getting ready to do is really this, it's not really about washing feet. 
It's really about this expression of love. It's about an expression of how I feel about you. See, I, I, and I still believe this. In fact, I think Crossbridge kind of, um, I think it's part of our culture. That, that how I believe that Jesus is best shared, right? It's not that I think we do need to share oftentimes through our mouths. But the way that Jesus, I think, is best shared is when people see his love through us. And oftentimes how they see that are these odd, peculiar kinds of ways in which when we show up and serve, we show up and do something for someone that causes them to say, why are you doing that? And I think when we do that over and over and our lives begin to look like that, that people, all of it, they, they begin to make sense of, I don't understand why they do that. But I think what God does is he uses those examples and he uses those acts to point to a love that goes beyond your own. That points to there's something else happening inside of you that drives you to love in this genuine, giving, sacrificial kind of way. I, um, I have some friends who... Um, they just bought a house. When I say just bought it, like they're still in the process, okay? And, um, and so they're, they're in the midst of this. And, and one of the things that I was, I've kind of been walking with them. And, um, and, and one of the things they said to me, I said, hey, when's the closing date? And they told me. And I said, so, so like, when are we moving, you know? And they had, you know, said, hey, it'll probably be around here. And I'm like, oh, I'm busy. <laughs> See, it, when it comes to moving, even 30 days out, I can tell you my calendar's pretty packed right? Are you with me? Who likes to help people move? That's what I thought, right? In fact, if, if you decide to move, take note of this. Whoever shows up to help you move, they're true friends, or they have a debt and they're working it off, one or the other, right? Because moving is not fun. In fact, moving is miserable. But I know this. When, when people show up to move people, it is like, it's kind of like foot washing. It's this great expression that says, man, they must love me because who in the world would do this for nothing, right? And uh, I'm just joking. I will do my best to help and show up, like to help them move, right? But th honestly, a lot of times we do that, right? We're like, hey, someone's moving. Like, oh, I'm sure I'm busy, right? Yeah, I know, I know that's what you do. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think the other question this passage causes us to ask, and I, and I think it's a great one because I think it's right at the center of this story. And, and at the center of this story is this question <clears throat> that would say, how are we doing with humility? How are we doing with humility? You know, the opposite of humility is what? Pride. And, and I think, you know, we know pride comes before the fall, right? There's many passages I could read you, and I'm not going to, that deal with this issue of pride. And in many ways, what you watch when Jesus walked around is that he was always, he was entering and he was practicing and he was loving with this genuine kind of humility. Now, you may be saying, hey, Kevin, you don't know me, but I'm the most humble person you'll ever meet. And if you're saying that, I'm glad you're here, right? Because this message is for you. <laughs> In fact, I, I remember um, when I went to college and I, in the summers, I would go home and I was basically, I would find an internship somewhere. I would find a church to work at in the summer. And the objective was, I thought, you know, I'm going to school and I'm learning this stuff, but I want a place to practice it. So every summer I would work to find somewhere where I could go and serve the Lord in some kind of capacity. And, and I remember the first summer I went back to Salem and there was a church about 30 minutes down the road in Flora, Illinois. It was, a, it was a little Nazarene church, and that pastor had said, hey, come on over, you know, we'll, uh, we'll take care of you, we'll, you know, we'll give you a little something, and so you can go back to college with, but I just want you to come and learn, come and serve. So that's what I did, and I learned a lot, and, and I remember about halfway through that summer, there was a gentleman that went to the church, and they'd kind of fallen on hard times, and this gentleman, um, he had a, like a bakery, um, and, and anyway, he sold donuts, right? They made donuts. And so my pastor came to me one day and he said, hey, Kevin, um, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to go and help Willie make donuts. And I thought, man, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I don't really remember that being in the job description. But if I guess, you know, and here's the thing about donuts. You don't make them at like one in the afternoon. 
It's third shift work, you know, which I'd never done before. I mean, I was a young kid. And, and so anyway, I said, okay. And really what I thought was, I thought, oh, this is like, you know, he's giving me like a second job. And so I showed up and I showed up at like midnight or whatever it was. And I worked through the night and I made donuts. You know, you make one, you eat one. You make one, you eat one. Pretty, pretty good. And, and in the midst of all that, and then like I had to show up the next night and the next night. It was, it was like a several day run of donut making because Willie was in a tough place. And, and at the end, you know, and in, so at the end of this whole thing, I thought, hey, you know what? I'm sure I'm going to like, I'm going to get a nice paycheck. It'll be nice. Like, um, this is like a second job. And at the end of it, well, Willie said, man, hey, I, I think that's good. I think like that's all we need. And, uh, and thank you. And I was like, thank you? And I was thinking, thank you. Like, are you sending me the check? And no, no. I, I mean, I realized I'd never clocked in and I'd never clocked out. I mean, I wasn't getting paid. I was just showing up because I was like one of the pastors at the church and I was there to serve. My pastor forgot to tell me that, right? And so, but I'll tell you what it was. I think he did it on purpose. I think it, it, was, this, it was this lesson. It was one of the big lessons that I learned that summer that, hey, ministry, it doesn't mean you get paid. It means sometimes you just show up when a family's down and you help. I want to tell you, it was a valuable lesson that I've remembered, right, 20 years later. Uh, now, you know, and truthfully, the donuts were worth it, right? <laughs> you know, I think about the roads of Palestine. They were dirt roads, right? Can, can you picture it with me? In dry weather, they would have been thick with dust. In wet weather, they would have been muddy. And what ordinary people wore was basically a sole on the bottom of their foot, with some leather straps around it that would have worked like a sandal. And it might have protected them from rocks and different things, but it would not have protected them from dirt. And you can imagine that when, when someone made the trek like over to someone's house and they walked, and they were walking everywhere, you can imagine what your feet would look like, right? I mean, they would be dirty. So what they would do is they would have these water pots, these water pots on the outside of a house. And typically there would be a servant who when you showed up at the house, you know, you'd, you'd probably kick off your sandal and they would wash your feet before you entered. You know, so you weren't going in the house with like nasty, nasty feet. It was just part of the custom. And the thought here was, in fact, I, I read one author who was writing about this. He said, you know, probably the thought here was that Jesus and his disciples, wherever they were gathering, that maybe there was a pot there, but there, there may not have been a servant. And so the disciples, you know, according to other scriptures, they struggle at times with, who's the greatest and who's the least, right? And that maybe there was this picture that the disciples had showed up and none of them was willing to take on the servant role and do the washing of feet. So what you see is Jesus says, if no one else is gonna wash them, you know what, I'm gonna model it. Can you picture that? That he goes outside, he sits by the water pot and he says, come on, fellas, get in line. And he begins to wash their feet. I mean, you can imagine at that time, all of them, my guess is, if that's really the way it went down, that all of them are thinking, oh, I wish I'd have, like, I, oh, I should have done this, right? As Jesus is scrubbing between their toes, I can picture it. See, Jesus had authority. And here's what I love about this passage. Listen to three through five. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he'd come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had around him. I love when it says Jesus had authority over everything but he chose to take off his robe and wrap the towel around his waist. See, the lesson here, the lesson here is that greatness, right, it comes by way of serving. The lesson here is not that Jesus had to. The lesson, Jesus was taking on the role of, of the least, the servants, what the servants did. And you can imagine that the reason why Peter is saying, no, 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 you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus is saying, oh, no, yes, I will. You don't understand what I'm doing, but you will one day. You know, I was reminded, I shared this story several years ago here, um, but I, I think it's worth sharing again. Um, <clears throat> I remember a lesson that my dad taught me. And I was, I was a young boy um, growing up in the Nazarene church in Salem, Illinois, and there was a man there who, um, truthfully, he didn't, he didn't have real good hygiene. Um, he, he really liked me. Like when he'd see me, like I'd see him coming and he always kind of like gave me a little hug. And, and I was always just kind of, I mean, truthfully as a kid, I just, oh, I never liked those hugs. And I always just kind of thought, ooh. And, 
and he had, he had a lot of issues. And one of the issues was his feet. I don't know what his physical ailment was, but he had these really tight socks that he wore, I guess to keep circulation. And he had these giant feet. And, and I remember for whatever reason, he came up to my family and he said, hey, um, would it be possible that you guys could come over and help me with my feet? And, and I remember listening, thinking, what? Help you with your feet? And my dad was like, yeah, we'll, we'll come over. We'll come over and help you with your feet. And I was thinking, dad, who's we? <laughs> Is that like you and mom? Because I'm hoping that's not me and you, right? And sure enough, we went over to this man's apartment and his wife was there and he was an older gentleman and, and he popped those feet up on this Ottoman thing and we sat there and they were giant and they were, they were hard and crusty and nasty. I'll never, ever forget it. And we, we got those socks off and we had to rub stuff on them. And my dad, he did some of the work, but then he let me take my turn too, right? And we went through this whole thing. And, and I really, the whole time I was like, I could not believe we were there working on these feet. And, and when I left, I just wanted to shower, right? And, and we left and we drove away. And I remember thinking, like, what are we doing? And, and my dad, like, he handled it like a pro. In fact, we, he laughed about it. You know, I think he thought it was funny, you know, that I hear I was. But, I, but I'll tell you this. What my dad didn't know, maybe he did know, right, was that that would be a life lesson. That this one, I'm, you know, truthfully, I'm sure my dad did not like to do the man's feet. You know, it, who, who would want to do that, right? But he did it. In fact, when he was asked, he didn't even hesitate. And he took me in the process. I look back and I think that was a lesson. That was a lesson that said to me as a little boy, this is what we do. When someone needs help, no matter what it is, even if it's nasty feet, we do it. Because this is who we are. You know, um, my dad did several things like that. You know, there was many times when we'd get done with something and he didn't necessarily tell me about it. He didn't really explain the lesson, but I think he trusted that down the road I would get it. See, and now here's what I would tell you too, though. I think there's a lot more going on in, in, pa in this passage than just humility. I think there's, a, in fact, a lot more going on. I was doing reading this week and it just kind of came to life for me. See, I, I think one of the questions is how are we really doing understanding what Jesus did for us? That's a great thing to check. How are we doing understanding what Jesus has really done for us? John 13, 7 and 8 says, Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus is saying, do you have too much pride to let me wash your feet? Because the way into the kingdom is not through pride. The way into the kingdom is through humility and wrapping the towel around your waist. You know, there's a passage in John that says, he must become greater and I must become less and less. And there's a passage in Luke that says, for, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And it, <clears throat> here's, here's what I think though big picture, is this wasn't just about feet, and this wasn't just about being clean on the outside. That what Jesus was saying is, hey, yes, this, what I'm doing right now is cleaning your feet on the outside, but really what I've come to do is to clean you on the inside. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who's bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entire, <clears throat> entirely clean. Now think about this. <clears throat> when it says here, a person who's bathed all over does not need to wash. Let me just give you a little cultural context. It was custom before people went to a feast, for if somebody went over to the house of another for a gathering, that they would bathe themselves. They would clean themselves up. We, we still do that today, right? Most of us. That that's what they would do. So they were presenting well. So what was dirty was the feet, not everything else. And, so, and I thought it was interesting, though, because I think what Jesus is saying is, you don't need me to wash what you can wash. 
You need me to wash what you can't. Think about baptism with me, the picture of humbling ourselves. Humbling ourselves and saying, it's not going to be my way, but I, I'm going to do my best to live yours. Humbling ourselves to say, God, I need you. I can't make it to heaven on my own. And I recognize the only way my sins will ever be forgiven is if I trust in you for it. See, we, you, you, you picture that when these folks showed up at a house, they need their feet washed before they enter, right? They need their feet washed to enter the household as guests. But you think about it as believers, we need our hearts washed to enter the household of God. Are you with me? See, I, people, when we think about Easter and we think about baptism, we think what happens right over here in this, in this water. It's not that people are showing up to get a bath. It's not that people are showing up with sandals and their feet are all dirty, you know? And so we're like, hey, go step over. We want to get you all cleaned up because it's Easter Sunday. Uh-uh. In fact, it's, it's not about getting the water off or the dirt off on the outside. It's a testimony that, say, that says that God has cleaned the dirt off on the inside and he's welcomed me into this household. What a picture. You know, and then I think about it. And, and this, is, this is just, this is Jesus, right? That all of a sudden, you know this, the, the disciples in the midst of this situation, Jesus takes off his robe, he puts on a towel, he's washing their feet. And I imagine they're so preoccupied with what he's doing. In fact, I'm guessing that they're talking about, can you believe he's washing our feet? I mean, uh, awkward, humbling. But here's what they wouldn't have gotten. In fact, I love when he says, you don't understand now, but you will understand later. See, what they would understand later is that this humility that was, that was being acted out in the midst of the washing of the feet was just the beginning. That the humility that was coming that was going to be acted out in a much larger scene was when Jesus would come and he would give up, Right? that he would walk to that cross, giving up all rights and privileges and giving, serving us in a way which would cost him his life as a criminal. There's a passage, and I want to read it to you. It's out of Philippians. It says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Sound familiar? He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, similar to the humble position of a servant who washed feet and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You know, I think back. My dad could have said the same thing to me, right? He could have said, Kevin, like, we're, we're doing this today, and you don't have any idea what it means. But someday you will. Jesus is looking at those disciples and saying, man, you're thinking this about feet. It's about something a whole lot greater than that. This is not about me washing you on the outside. Man, this is about me washing you clean on the inside. And I will humble myself I will make myself a suffering servant on behalf of you that you may live forever in my kingdom. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this great picture that challenges us in so many ways. It challenges us. You give us a picture of what it looks like to love. You get a picture of what it looks like, this humility that has all divine privileges and yet gives them up for the sake of others, for the sake of us. You give us this picture which helps us to see exactly what you did for us. And then, Lord, at the end of this passage, you remind us that not only did you do this for us, but you called us to do the same thing. That you called us not just to receive this, but to live in the same kind of manner. That the world would not see us, but that the world would see you. That one day they might wake up in the midst of us serving people and loving people. And they would wake up and not just see the act of service. 
say, man, what is that? I don't understand. But they would understand. They would see you, this great God at work in the midst of our hearts and lives. God, check us. Check our hearts. Are we really to the place to where we're loving people around us, where we're trying to find ways to serve, where we're practicing humility, where we're looking at your example and saying, I want to follow you. I want to be like you, Jesus. Help me. Lord, we thank you for the example that you set, for the pictures that you gave us, and the way that you live in us and you empower us to live the way you've called us to live. In this response time, I pray that you would challenge us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.